It is Tuesday, September 11th, 2018. My name is Ashton Ellett, here with another installment of the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Joining me today is former Georgia Insurance Commissioner John Oxendine. Mr. Oxendine was elected Insurance Commissioner in 1994, becoming one of the first Republicans elected to a statewide constitutional office. Prior to that, he had served as a member and chairman of the Georgia State Personnel Administration. Mr. Oxendine is a graduate of Mercer University and the Walter F. George School of Law, also at Mercer. And he is currently an attorney and consultant at the Oxendine Group here in Atlanta. Thank you very much, Mr. Oxendine, for taking the afternoon to talk uh, history and politics. Uh, Good to be here with you. I was wondering if we could start, uh, tell me a little bit about your childhood and your upbringing. Well, I've always been a Southerner. I was born in Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, lived there the first few years of my life, two short years in Orlando before Walt Disney uh, came down there. A different world then. Uh, it was a different Orlando. And <laughs> at the ripe old age of five years old, I moved to Atlanta. And I have lived in Atlanta ever since I was five, uh, since 1967. Lived in three counties. We moved to DeKalb County, lived in that area, and then we moved to out further into Cab County, moved to Gwinnett County. Now I live in North Fulton. So kind of haven't moved around much since then. <laughs> so, so you moved around, but in a relatively small area, narrow radius. Yeah. So uh, tell me about the, 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 the Atlanta you grew up in, sort of the Tucker you know, area. And I remember when I was a little boy, it was late 60s, um, the Hyatt Regency Hotel mm -hmm. had opened. And the Polaris room, that's the big blue dome that younger people seeing this probably don't even know there is a blue dome there or <laughs> have never seen it. But that used to be the hot, sort of the outline of the skyline of Atlanta included the blue dome of the Hyatt Regency. And my daddy, uh, who was an attorney and Superior Court judge mm -hmm. here in Atlanta, he took me to the, up there to the Polaris room, to that blue dome. And I could look out over the whole city. It was towering over the city of Atlanta. And uh, now I think if you go there, you're looking at someone's computer screen at the office across, you know, across the street. <laughs> uh, so it, it, it's really changed, really changed a lot. Um, Atlanta was a, a big southern town. And uh, now it's a major international city. And, and just as Georgia used to be a, a southern state, um, it is southern, but it also is a major I think it's maybe about the ninth largest state, give or take, mm -hmm. in the country. It is a major economic force, a lot different than what it was in the late 60s. What do you think accounts, this is skipping way ahead, but what do you, what do you think accounts for the growth of, of a city of Atlanta and, and more, more to the point, metropolitan Atlanta, where we're at? Um, it's actually what started Atlanta largely was transportation, you know, the railroad. Um, but today it's not necessarily the railroad, it's Delta. Mm -hmm. And we had Air Tran for a while, which now part of Southwest and everything, but just uh, having a major air hub and I think having the Port of Savannah, even though the Port of Savannah is not in Atlanta, it seems like everything from the Port of Savannah comes through. And it just, I think that with the fact that it's warmer here, mm -hmm. the climate's better, and the North, the industrialization of the North, it's sort of the rust belt of the North, the bigger regulation, uh, very burdensome regulation in the Northern states. So I think it just pushed people to the South and Atlanta was viewed as, it's easy to get here, it's easy to get anywhere else from Atlanta. It's a logical place and I think that's a lot of it. So it was what we had to offer, but I think the Northern states and cities have largely pushed a lot of people in business out of there. Mm. So you, you, you mentioned your dad, mm -hmm. uh, James Oxendine, yes. Judge Oxendine. Tell me about, your father was a, was a judge, very, very prominent Democrat, mm -hmm. um, with Joe Frank Harris, Sel Miller, yes. that, that group. He was very close to them. T t tell, me about, tell me about watching uh, your father and being involved in sort of his political um, goings on. How was that, you know, standing at the periphery and growing up? It's what got me interested in politics and government. Uh, my dad 
goes back. He was good friends with Zell Miller back when he was lieutenant governor, mm -hmm. long, mm -hmm. long time ago. And he was good friends with George Busby. And okay. then, you know, the new guy, Joe Frank Harris, that came around. And, I mean, you know, um, Speaker Murphy. You know, all those folks were old friends of my dad, and he was a contemporary with them. Mm -hmm. And I grew up around politics and really enjoyed not so much the politic part of it, but a lot of it was the government service and doing something. And, and I was taught that it's good to give back to the community and try to make it better. And always assumed that I would probably enter a political career and do it as a Democrat. It would never occur to me to have been a Republican in those days. In those days, the, there was the term Georgia Democrat. Right. People commonly used it. They say, you a Democrat? No, I'm a Georgia Democrat. And, and people said that very proudly. And it meant something. It, it did. It was like, don't you dare call me a Democrat. You call me a Georgia Democrat, or sometimes maybe a Southern Democrat. But those terms were used, and it was insulting to a lot of people to refer to them as a Democrat. And that's, you know, I think that's something that good, you know, our family friend Zell Miller saw that he was a Southern Democrat and he could be a Democratic governor and be conservative when he joined the College of the Senate. As a member of the Democratic Party, he was kind of forced to step in line with the Democratic Party, which he didn't feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. and, why he left. Um, you know, it was clear he was not comfortable being in the Senate because he felt forced to be something that he was not as a governor. So were, how active were you in politics in high school and college? Very much. I, uh, I remember working on Zell Miller's campaign um, when he uh, ran for lieutenant governor okay. uh, in high school. Um, I interned in college for Governor Busby uh, and worked right there at his office. I was kind of the little, kind of the, the gopher, you yeah. know, um, had a desk right outside the governor's office and I, you know, did whatever the executive secretary told me to do, you know. <laughs> so, who, who was his, 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 his um, I guess it'd be chief of guy, staff these well, days. But. Chief, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, chief of staff is now what you used right. to call an executive secretary. Um, it was, uh, you had two guys there. You had Tom Daniel, who mm -hmm. I immediately worked for, and they were kind of joint in that. Both had the same title. And then the other one was um, Tom Perdue. Yeah, okay. So my two immediate bosses were Tom Perdue and Tom Daniel, and they were direct reports to, the, uh, to Governor Busby. Okay. And then Joe Frank Harris's first campaign headquarters uh, was actually in my dad's law office in Norcross. It consisted of the law library, Joe Frank Harris, who was the, uh, um, I think he was the Democratic leader of the House, I believe may have been, or maybe he was appropriations. He was appropriations Appropriations He was appropriations. A high-ranking member yeah. of the House, yeah. yes. And he, he sat in my dad's law conference room, and dad had ordered phone books from all over the state. And you could get them. And he had phone books from every little town. And the room was filled with phone books and a couple of telephones. And it was started with future Governor Harris sitting there making phone calls, <laughs> using phone books. So <laughs> it's know? so it's different, something very few people that, today even know what, it, what a phone book is. <laughs> but it's not that different from you know it, a lot of it's sitting on the phone and making phone calls and stuff. Maybe they just yeah. don't print the phone books anymore. It, it, it really, I mean, I'm trying to remember what year that probably was. 82 81, ish, 82, 81, 82 yeah. was the election. So year, this was so. probably late 80, early mm -hmm. 81, and it was literally him making phone calls. And today if you were going to start a campaign, you would make phone calls and, and send emails right? Um, and maybe Twitter or something else, but it's with the technology, that's what it was. And that actually was before they actually had a real campaign office. That was literally the first days of the Joe Frank Harris campaign for governor. So I, 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 sp I was active. <laughs> you know, I grew up around it. My right, dad was right. active and I was the guy there, sure, you know, sure. my dad's feet. And, and then, you know, you mentioned Tom Perdue. Tom Perdue was campaign manager for, for Joe Frank Harris yep. in 82. He and my dad were good friends. And, 
And, and Bobby Kahn. Bobby mm -hmm. Bobby Kahn used to work for my dad. At, right. He was a I read that lawyer. Somewhere. Used to work for my dad when he got out of law school. His first job as a lawyer was working for my dad's law okay. firm. Okay, two political careers that have slightly. <laughs> but you know, I still consider Bobby a friend, sure, and he is a sure, good sure. person. Uh, think the world of him. We just do not agree on very many things. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, agreeing to disagree is a, is a lost <laughs> art sometimes. <laughs> so you know, I, I guess that's leading us to the question. That's a good segue into what led you away from the Democratic Party. Surprising to a lot of people, it was someone who is viewed as not that liberal of a Democrat. It was Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton was really not that liberal of a president. You know, he had a lot of personal issues that were highly questionable. Mm -hmm. he did. But Bill Clinton did something that probably needed to be done for the Democratic Party. Being a Southerner, and coming from a state like Arkansas that was conservative, mm -hmm. and Governor um, uh, Zell Miller was one of Bill Clinton's best friends in the world. So what happened was Zell Miller, Bill Clinton, they took all these southern state Democratic parties and said, we need to have a unified national Democratic Party. I mean, it, it was always been technically a unified party, but I don't think it really was mm -hmm. prior to Bill Clinton. And I think Democratic Party historians, if they were to be honest, they'd have to admit that's when a Democrat was a Democrat and you no longer said, I'm a Southern Democrat, I'm a Northern Democrat. You became a Democrat. They were nationalized parties. Really after the brought it together. And I remember saying, well, Maybe being a Democrat today is okay. Do I still want to be a Democrat in 10 years, in 15 years? Because I could see where the party in Georgia was getting more like the party in New York, in Chicago, in California. And I knew that was a party that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life in. And I was a young person right out of college, right out of law school. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of when I made that decision that I don't, I don't want to be a Democrat the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So I'm a conservative. I've always been a conservative. When I was a Democrat, I am no more conservative today than I was conservative when I was a Democrat. Mm -hmm. um, it's simply the party's changed. You know, well, they're saying I didn't leave the party, the party left me. Well, somebody who's come up a lot already in this interview is Joe Frank Harris. And Joe Frank Harris was a, a very personally conservative mm -hmm. person. I'm, I believe he was a teetotaler, didn't didn't drink That's alcohol, correct. very, very uh, a born again Christian, yes. very, very upfront about his Christian beliefs. And uh, well, I, this is a question I usually ask towards the, the, the latter part, but since it's already come up, what's the, we've already talked how there's not necessarily a distinction between Georgia Democrats and Democrats, but how much difference has it been from having Democratic governors like Joe Frank Harris and George Busby to Republican governors like Sonny Perdue and, and Nathan Deal? I don't think it's actually been a difference, a substantial difference in the type of government. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the, the concentration on family, the concentration on business, um, just sticking to good old fashioned American values, I don't think, and I may be making some enemies right now, but I, I don't think Governor Deal and Governor Purdue have been that much different from a Governor Miller, a Governor Harris, a Governor Busby. I don't really remember much past Busby. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I know Lester Maddox was governor, but I was probably riding my tricycle right. or something. You know, <laughs> um, I'm not sure it's been a huge, a huge difference. I mean, times have changed. Sure. Obviously, things you could say and do then you wouldn't say and do now. I mean, but the basic of they were conservative business people um, that valued, you know, America, valued God, and uh, wanted to Georgia to have good business and to prosper. Do you think it? Do you think it has mattered or matters at all that? The, the two Republican governors the state's had since, since Reconstruction were both former Democrats who had held office and were elected as Democrats? 
I don't know if it makes that I mean, that's a true fact, but that's probably true of everyone in that generation. They're both right. a tad older than me, but with, with very few exceptions. With yeah. me and the people older than me, there's so many of us used to be a Democrat. Now you got people like Paul Coverdale. Mm -hmm. I think he was born a Republican. I'm you know? pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. Johnny Isaacson, you know, that's so Johnny there, Isaacson. Like so there said, are exceptions. exceptions to the well, rule. that's back when Paul Coverdale and Johnny Isaacson were the entire Republican caucus of the pretty, state legislature. Pretty much. You know, yeah. I think there may have been five or six others. <laughs> Bob Bell from just just up the road. Bob Bell used to be my state senator when I lived in DeKalb County. Good man. Very, very nice man. Interesting, interesting thing I remember as a child in DeKalb, not to go on too much of a tangent. No, but no. When I was a little boy, the Democrats often did not bother to even put a Democrat up for a lot of local offices. You know, maybe some of the, I mean, it was some of the county commission seats and sheriff. Mm -hmm. and I mean, why run a Democrat? Democrat never get elected in DeKalb County. It was the most Republican county in the whole state. Everyone was a Republican. There were no other Republicans hardly in, in Georgia. Well, we're in Brookhaven, <laughs> you know? sort of ground zero. For, yeah. You know, Brookhaven, it's All the Brookhaven Buckhead Pipeline. That was about the only place. Only where... place there were. And of course now DeKalb is, if it's not the most Democratic, it's close to it. Uh, <laughs> it, would, it would be DeKalb or Clayton, yeah. which, which again, there's an irony in Clayton <laughs> County being, being that strongly Democratic. But I, I read a quote of yours, you know, right around when you switched parties, you said, uh, or what now, this would have been later on, but you, you were recalling, it says, what I liked about the Republican Party is, is you believed it was more Democratic than the Democratic Party. Yes. What, 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 did, you, what did you mean by that? <sighs> if, if Thomas Jefferson were alive today, who is often viewed, and, and, and I would say President Jackson, you know, Jefferson Jackson is always, those two, Andrew Jackson, Thomas mm -hmm. Jefferson, yeah, the, the founders of the Democratic Party. If they were both alive today, I have no doubt that they would be Republicans. Mm -hmm. Because of the real, various realignments. That the they believed in limited government. They believed in power to the people. The most powerful government should be the government closest to the people. Your cities, your counties, your states. The government further away from the people being the national government should be the least powerful. That's what Republicans believe, or at least true conservative Republicans believe that, and that's what they did. If Abraham Lincoln, even though he's viewed as the, you know, a father of the Republican Party, Abraham Lincoln would be a Democrat if he were alive today. Abraham Lincoln believed in a strong central mm -hmm. Washington government. He wanted decisions made in Washington and not made by local governors and state legislatures. And again, I might. People are probably going to say bad stuff about this video, but I have no doubt Abraham Lincoln would be a Democrat in today's world. So it's, again, I didn't change. The guy I was was a Democrat, didn't change. Mm -hmm. It's just the parties literally flipped. Well, tell, tell me about who, you know, when you got involved in the Georgia Republican Party, it was, this would have been early 1990s. So. Who were the people that, that, that you sort of found at the party? And describe the party as you found it. Um, two people, I would say, kind of took me in in Georgia. I knew Skin Edge. He, mm -hmm. was the, he was a senator. He was the Republican leader of the Senate, which was the minority, obviously. And I knew him. He and my dad were friends. I mean, but as obviously was older, but sure. You know, they were attorneys, and Skin's an attorney, and I was a young attorney. And I made an appointment to go see him at the Capitol. And I told him I was thinking about becoming a Republican. And he said, that's great. And I said, well, do y'all want me? I mean, I've been a Democrat. And see, and that was before a lot of people were switching. It was kind of before, you know, Michael Bowers had not changed parties. Right. You know, it, it wasn't cool to switch parties. I mean, I was literally... Like I said, I mean, it was years, it was two years later before Michael party, Bowers changed. Party, party switchers did not have a good history. It, it, yes, it, it was, and I didn't know if the Republicans wanted me. And he said, yeah, we'd love to have you. You know, you're well thought of, you know people. I mean, you're a young, bright guy, I guess, whatever. I don't remember exactly what he said. Sure. And I said, well, I don't know, how do I do that? 
And he said, well, Billy Lovett is the chairman of the Republican Party. I'm going to call Billy Lovett and make an appointment. He said, would he, would he see me? I said, I think Billy would like to see you. And Billy saw me, and we met, and got to know and like each other. I had been thinking about running for political office, and Billy recruited me to run for state insurance commissioner as a Republican. The, the, the office that he had just run for in 1990? That he had previously run for and got beat by a Democrat. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, so insurance commissioner, that's something that, that, that Billy talked you into to running for? Or, or was that something that it was sort of a mutually a, agreed? I'd say it was kind of mutual. I mean, okay. I think Billy had an interest. Right. Because he had been the Republican nominee. Mm -hmm. He had been beat by the sitting Democratic mm -hmm. insurance commissioner. Tim Riles. So, Tim Riles. It was, had been an open seat. Right. And he had lost the Democrats. So, you know, they probably wanted to get back even a little bit, I guess. But I had been chairman. At that time, they called it the State Personnel Board. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the insurance plan for state employees came under the Personnel Board. It's changed now. Yeah. But at the time... Unity. Yes, Something community around. health. But at the time, I was chair of the board that ran the health insurance plan for all state employees. Okay. So and and school sense. teachers. And school teachers. So okay. school teachers, state employees, the state health, benefit, the state plan health benefit plan. I was, there was a board of directors and I was chair of that board that ran it. So that really got me interested in a lot of the insurance issues. Okay. So tell me about, you know, you, you had watched Joe Frank Harris run, you'd watched your dad run, or, or I guess your dad would have been. Well, my dad had never point. run for office. He was always supporting. Well, I guess he ran, for, he was appointed judge and then ran for re-election. Sure. Yeah. So tell me about mount, mounting your own, your first campaign is a statewide campaign, not always the easiest uh, you know, to cut your teeth off. Um, started calling a lot of friends, calling people I knew. A lot of them were actually Democrats, <laughs> and some of them um, started meeting a lot of new Republicans. Um, Billy Lovett was a big help. Uh, fortunately, there was not another Republican running for insurance right. commissioner. So even in the primary process, he was still able to help me until someone else said they wanted to run, and they didn't. So early in the system, um, Billy really got out there, and he helped me a lot. Um, and could do that because there was really no conflict. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I kind of had some, I didn't know how to put a campaign together and they, they hooked me up with a, a guy to do mail pieces and a guy to do this and, and really helped me with a lot of that infrastructure. So the, and of course I had worked on, I had actually worked, I was actually a paid employee of uh, Joe Frank Harris's first campaign for governor, too. So I had actually worked in his campaign head, in a statewide campaign headquarters, and also had seen how the structure would be. So it wasn't be. completely alien. It was, it was. No, I mean, I had worked, again, I was very low ranking. Um, I was actually high ranking to get paid. It was a very, very minimal pay. Right. <laughs> I think it paid my gas bill and parking. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was actually a regular employee of Governor Harris's campaign, so I had seen some of it and sort of tried to duplicate what I had sure. seen other people sure. do. So this, you know, what was the platform you're running on for, for insurance commissioner? Because I, I think, you know, this is no, no disrespect, it's not necessarily a race that gets a lot of attention, especially in a, an election year where you've got, you know, all the House seats are, are up and, and other things like that. That was largely a governor's my, race yeah. is going on. I think my slogan was he's a family man, he's a religious man, he's a man you can trust. Um, we had scenes taken at church, um, you know, the family. I mean, it was just sort of a lot of it was just a generic, he's a good guy, vote for him kind of thing, <laughs> you know. Um, that was, yeah, there were when I would get into more detailed things at a Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. or a Rotary Club, right. um, I'd get into the issues. The workers, uh, workers' compensation at that time in the early 90s was horrendous. There were people that actually, kind of like today, a lot of people are saying, can I afford to have a business to pay health insurance for my, you know, because health insurance is so expensive. Mm -hmm. At that time, 
it wasn't health insurance, it was workers' compensation insurance. It was so expensive. It was hampering people's ability to employ people. What, why, why was that in the, in the early 90s? It had been greatly mismanaged. Um, the system was broken. Uh, we have something called the assigned risk pool. It's the place of, of last resort. No one will give you insurance, but since the law requires you to have it, there was a, a pool that the, that the government oversaw and you could get it from there. It was extremely expensive. 25% mm -hmm. of the market of workers' compensation of Georgia was in that assigned risk pool. That place of last resort that no one wanted, this government-mandated <laughs> program of the rejects of the world, so to speak, was 25% of the state. That's not right. That number, I don't know what the number runs now. When I was commissioner, it would run three, two, three percent. So, a, a, so you know, <laughs> big difference. <laughs> yeah, and you should. I mean, you're 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 sort of insurance rejects. Not that right. they're bad people, but people no one wants to sure, touch. Sure. I mean, it, it it should never be double digits. It, it should be single digits. It might get as high as the five, six percent of the economy's not In good. Downturns, yeah. But it, it should always be very low. 90 plus percent should be able to get insurance in the market. It was only 75% of people could get insurance in the market. So, and, and we changed it, and within a couple of years, we had that number below 10%. Um, but that was a big issue, and that was, that was probably the substantive issue I largely campaigned on. I saw, a, this may surprise some people, but you got the endorsement of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. In yeah, I'll probably never do that again, you know. <laughs> no, I'm not going to lie, I was a little surprised and I read it twice. But it was, uh... So, 5149, 1994, yeah. John Oxendine elected, going, you know, going into election night. You're, you're a Republican running statewide in Georgia in 1994. How confident were you that you were going to pull, pull the race out against an incumbent? I was right. not confident. Um, I was nervous. I, I knew I had a good chance to win. I knew I could win. I, but I didn't know. Right. I didn't know I was going to win. I mean, it was an uphill battle. I was. He had more money, more name ID. I mean, you know, there had never been a Republican elected insurance commissioner in the history of the state. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was. My dad, I remember it was neck and neck. It was real close all night, um, nervous as can be. And my dad said, I'm going to go to the room, go to bed. You're going to win. And I said, you're crazy. You're going to abandon me? He said, hey, you're going to win. No, he had, we all had rooms there at the hotel. And <laughs> I'm going to go to the room. I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> he was confident. He, he had made up his mind I was going to win. And um, I was... Quite nervous. I, I, you know, I never really made an acceptance speech that night because it was, it was one of those went into the wee hours. Right. And by the time I knew I had won, it was like everybody had, had gone to bed. It was, I don't remember two o'clock something crazy like that in mm -hmm. the morning. Um, there were probably very few people to make a speech to at that time. Right. right. Well, I mean, that, <laughs> yeah. that was the same race where Governor Miller almost lost um, to, yes. to, to Guy Milner. Um, how much interaction did you have with, with Guy Milner's campaign or, or, or with David Schaefer, who had been executive director and was running Guy Milner's a campaign? A lot. Um, actually, I hired David Schaefer to work in my administration That's as right. insurance That's right. And... Uh, there was a lot of coordination. Um, the party had to spend, the party when they would spend money, and this is rule today, mm -hmm. you'll probably see it coming up in the upcoming races. The party has to spend money on two or more candidates. And I was one that the party was, because Billy Lovett kind of took me under his wing, um, they, they spent a lot of money on me. So it'd be, there were TV ads, and it would be Guy Milner, and of course, his would be about 75% of the ad. Sure. But, you know, also if it's a 30 second ad, it'd be maybe 20 minutes of Guy Milner <laughs> and then about 10 seconds or eight or 10 seconds of John Oxendine, but still um, something that I couldn't have afforded on my oh, own. Oh, sure, sure. And 
and Guy had to have someone thrown in there with him or the party couldn't run the ad. So there were a lot of TV ads uh, that were Guy Milner slash John Oxendine ads. And, and so, yeah, we worked very closely together. So you take office. What's it like you're in a constitutional office, but the governor is a Democrat, the lieutenant governor is a Democrat, so you got Zell Miller and Pierre Howard, Tom Murphy's still Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. what, what was it like trying to navigate that landscape as a Republican? I learned a big lesson. If I had could do it over, I would have gotten everything in the world I ever wanted that first legislative session because they were actually real nice to me. <laughs> they were. I mean, we had some budget problems. They helped me out. I wanted to do the workers' comp reform. They, they actually gave me most of what I asked for uh, that first legislative session. I said, this is great. The Democrats, they're going to treat me just like an equal. They're going to be real nice to me. And it was wonderful. And then I found out that's called a political honeymoon. And <laughs> I was treated very nicely that first legislative session. Come about Easter time, <laughs> of 1995, I was reminded that I was in the minority party. <laughs> and and it, it was, I was a minority. And there were people that, Murphy was not nice to me. Other people, um, I mean, George Hooks would be senator then, appropriations, he'd be nice to me. Uh, Terry Coleman, who I think might be a Republican, I'm not sure if he calls himself a Republican now or not. Terry Coleman was appropriations chairman. I mean, he would be nice to me, um, but they would also sort of arm's length. Down. Well, they'd be nice to you and to your face, and they'd tell you you're going to do something. But they, you know, sometimes they would, sometimes they they, they would kind of give you the shaft a few times behind your back, you know. Um, but there was some. There was a guy, um, Jimmy Lord longtime chairman of the insurance committee, and he was actually, would be nice and would say, you know, you okay, you're the insurance commissioner, we need to work together as a team. And he was respectful of me on insurance issues. Now on other issues, the heck with it, but I mean on that, and I mean he did work with me a lot, but it was, uh, it was challenging. So how, how did your re-election, uh, you, you were the 98, how did that compare to your first experience? Oh, well, completely different. Um, I was the incumbent. I, I had money. Um, and, you know, I, I, many of my re-elections, I would generally be either the biggest or close to the biggest vote-getter in the state. I mean, you know, it was, uh, you know, I mean, they were, went very well. It, I, I saw. I would be nervous every time. Well, <laughs> that, that just means you're paying attention and you're and you're probably sane. <laughs> well, in 2000, when uh, when Paul Coverdell passed away mm -hmm. suddenly, there there was some talk of, of you running in, in that special election against your mm -hmm. father's old friend Zell Miller. Yeah. What convinced you not to not to make that leap? I I, I had thought about it. And I wanted, I think there's a different mentality. And, and actually, I, I think right now, and of course, this, I'm dating this by 2018, but we've got a few places right now where we've got governors, a governor in Florida running for the U.S. Senate against a, a Democratic senator. Um, we've got a former governor in Tennessee mm -hmm. running for the Senate. And I really looked at, and governors always want to be senators. Well, I think often that's a mistake. I think a, uh, there are skills to be a legislator. Mm -hmm. There are skills to be, a sen to be a governor or an executive, to be an executive official, and they're completely different. Right. An executive official is... You run some. You're like a Donald Trump. You're a businessman. You're a CEO of a corporation. That is what I was in my small company of the insurance and fire commissioner's office. Mm -hmm. The governor is that with the larger executive 
Department of the State, a senator is like sits on a committee, sits on a board, you know, it, it's, it's a collegiate thing. It's like an association. A senator cannot do a single thing on his own. And I think for, and I've been told this actually by some former governors that became senators, that they became very frustrated because they were used to making a decision and issuing an order. And senators can't do that. And where, yes, I, I mean, it would be a great honor to have run and if sure. I'd been fortunate sure. enough to, to be a U.S. senator. But my skill set is to do things alone. I'm here in a law firm and we got two lawyers and I'm married to the lawyer here. <laughs> and I don't want any, I could go hire five more lawyers and have plenty of work for them. But I don't want to be in a group of people. I, I want to make my decision, you know, be the executive where things are done and get things done. That's not the legislature. Like, like you you got to play nice with others. <laughs> well, there, there you go. There you go. <laughs> so 2002 rolls around, and Sonny Perdue shocks the world, mm -hmm. uh, most of the world. Yeah. Um, Oh, I think he was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but lo and behold, you 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 have a a Republican in the governor's mansion, mm -hmm. and and the Senate comes along, uh, Jack Hill and Rooney Bowen mm -hmm. and all those those guys. What? How did that change your life for you in the the insurance commission? I, it made it much better. I mean, I had a governor I could work with. I had, even though. I never really worked that much with governors. It was more of just outside of the budget because right. it is a constitutional office. Mm -hmm. And since it's an independent constitutional office, governors generally didn't mess with insurance issues. If a governor was getting involved in an insurance issue, it was probably a problem going on or something. Um, so most of my interaction was really more budgetary type stuff because the governor does largely control the budget. Right. Um, I found I had a lot of good friends in the Senate and I was able to work with people and there were nice guys in the Senate. Tom Murphy was still Speaker of the House, I believe. <laughs> um, <laughs> or maybe it has... No, he had just... He had it just, has switched um, to Terry Coleman, I guess. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. yes, because Terry Coleman beat Larry Walker. That was right. For, um, to be Speaker. But uh, it was still, you know... I think the Democrats in the House were nicer uh, because it was more of a two-party state. Yeah. But it was still challenging. There were a lot of things I remember, it's like, well, there's a bad piece of legislation, it's gonna get through the House, but we can kill it in the Senate. You know, or it'd be like, well, we know we can get this through the Senate, can we get it through the House? And I remember having that discussion with my team a lot. So in 2006, you briefly announced that you were, you were gonna make a run for Lieutenant Governor. Yes. Very briefly. What made you, you know, dip dip the toe in the water, and then sort of? I I, I I was looking at it. I was thinking about are there other ways I can serve the people and serve the state? Because you had been and, you had been commissioner for twelve years. Yeah, I've been there for twelve point. years. And again, kind of back at the U.S. Senate, mm -hmm. lieutenant governor is not an executive position. It really isn't. I'm probably going to offend people, but. The lieutenant governor is not an executive. I mean, yes, he's the executive branch. He's, I mean, I mean, on paper, on the Constitution, he isn't. The lieutenant governor is a legislative officer from a practical standpoint. There's no agency he runs. There's no public policy he sets from an executive standpoint. Mm -hmm. Now, he is a, very influential in the public policy that the state senate and the legislature sets, but... I, my skill set is set to be an executive. And as I looked at it more and realized Lieutenant Governor is not an executive official. So it's kind of the same, you know. S same thing as, yeah. as in 2000. So you run for, win re-election as insurance commissioner again. When did, you, when did you make the decision, and maybe this was before that election, that you were going to try for, for the governor's office I had been, Sonny Perdue? I had been thinking office. about governor for a while, and, and I was thinking about there is lieutenant governor. Um, and I remember actually having the realization that was I running for lieutenant governor because I thought 
that was something where I could really change things in the state, or am I doing it because it'll make it easier to run for governor? And I had to be honest, and I told myself, yeah, the only reason I really want to be lieutenant governor is to turn around and run for governor. Because, as a stepping stone. To and that's not right. That's not honest. It's not honest to say, I want this job, but the only reason I want it is to get another job, even though people do that all the time. Oh, sure. That wouldn't have been honest for me to do that. And that's why, yes, I was thinking I high likelihood I'd run for governor, but I didn't need to run for lieutenant. It, it just it wasn't the right thing to do. So, you know, you had seen and worked with, with Democratic governors and a Republican governor. You announce in, in 2008 or nine that you're that you're going to be something, running something like that. I don't even remember. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but but in your in your thinking, what were you bringing to the governor? What would you have brought to the governor's mansion? What were what were you running on? Um, where well, our two so many of our governors of both parties were legislators. And when I talked about, I'm probably again going to make a lot of people mad, but when I said there's a different skill set to be an executive than to be a legislator, I think it works both ways. I was talking before about being a governor, then becoming a senator, mm -hmm. how you're, but it's the same thing. If I had seen a tradition of legislators becoming governors, and I felt like that wasn't necessarily the best way to do it. I've, I believe that a governor should probably be someone who had run a government agency. Um, and we haven't had that. I mean, I can't say ever, uh, I'm but, sitting here. I, well, I'm sitting here trying know, to think. <laughs> I don't know if we ever have. We probably will uh, in a month or so from now with Secretary of State Kemp, the Republican nominee for mm -hmm. governor, will most likely be our governor. He's who I voted for. I hope he becomes governor. But um, he will. he may be the first governor who's actually run executive government. And I, where I think Governor Deal's done a good job, Governor Purdue, I mean, other governors done a good job, that's a skill set that I think we have missed. And that's that was something that was driving me to run for governor is say, we need to have an executive who's governor, not a legislator. I think the last executive would have been Ellis Arnold, who was attorney general. And that would have been 1942. Yeah. It, it, of Can course, tell I, you I, studied I, I, history I, at the university <laughs> at, at college. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I, th I think that's right. And we're not counting Lester Maddox, who ran who ran a restaurant. So. <laughs> a little little different. Um, so you know, you're in you're in the governor's race. You're the first announced. Mm -hmm. You were you know, by, far and away the front runner for a very long time in the race. Looking back, did that hurt your chances being so prominent yeah, so long? Uh, in any election, the nice thing is it's nice to be the front runner early. It's, that's the nicest thing and it's also the worst thing. <laughs> Presidential, let's look at Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush was, had the Republican nomination for president. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know why the other people were running. It was Jeb Bush. I mean, that's all you ever heard. Mm -hmm. Jeb Bush, I don't even know if he made it to the Georgia primary. I don't even think he, he did. He, he dropped out after South Carolina. Third, yeah. Third place in third. Yeah, third place in South Carolina. Yeah. He didn't even get as far as the Georgia primary. I mean, my God, he was one of the earlier guys to drop out. I mean, he was the first half of people to drop out. Mm -hmm. And he had been the front runner. And what happens is the front runner is the guy everybody shoots at. Every, you got 10 people running, and there's one guy in the front. The other nine are going to shoot at the guy in the front. You're not going to shoot at the guy next to you. And that's what happened with Governor Bush when he ran for president. Everybody was taking shots at Bush. Um, that's why everybody was taking shots at me. And, you know, it's, it's, that's politics. It's life. You know, in retrospect, I have no, I would have liked to have been governor. I think I could have contributed governor. But you know what? This is what I wear every day. <laughs> I wear, if, if it, this is summertime, if this was being filmed in the wintertime, I'd have blue jeans and cowboy boots on. It's just when it's 100 degrees outside, cowboy boots get a little hot for me. 
<laughs> but I, this is how I dress. I'm only nice to people I want to be nice to. I, I, I make more money in the private sector. I'm happier. I have more time with my family. And Lent sits, Lent in a, in a courtroom where it's a funeral, I don't wear a tie. <laughs> well, you, you, you know, you, you left office in 2011, so you'd been wearing a coat and tie 17 years. Long time, long time. <laughs> so, so you know, what, what are you most proud of when you, when you, when you look back um, at your 17 years in, in the insurance commission? The uh, automobile insurance rates were my entire time, we kept it in the cheaper half, the less expensive half of the country. Um, a state like Georgia would never be the cheapest state because we have a major American city. I mean, Montana, you know, you got to be afraid, don't want your car to hit a cow, you know, or Wyoming. Or <laughs> yeah, so, you know, there, there, there are certain states that you just can't compare, but among the large population states, Georgia was consistently the lowest. Um, we would trade back and forth with North Carolina and we would always be way cheaper than any other state approaching our size. I got, I was able to slash the price of workers' comp 50% um, in, in three years and later got it down to about uh, almost 75% of what it used to be. I mean, if someone was paying $10,000 in workers' comp insurance for their business, within a few years, we had it down to half that, to 5,000. That's pretty big. We passed portability and health insurance a year before Congress did. Everybody thinks, oh, you can take your health insurance with you from one job to another. Yeah, we passed that two, a year before, um, actually about a year and a half before Congress did. Um, and that was a big thing because at the time, people were trapped in a job. They were afraid to lose your job. If you're working at the University of Georgia mm -hmm. and you were offered a job at the University of Alabama, you would be afraid to leave and take it because you might lose your health insurance. And if, you were in, in, and if you were in bad health, you're not, but if you were, you had cancer, you wouldn't be able to get new health insurance. Or let's say you wanted to start your own company. Right. You couldn't start your own company because you, you would be uninsurable, you couldn't get insurance. And it was trapping people into jobs. Um, and those were things that we did, we're very proud of. The other is, I wasn't just the insurance commissioner, I was the fire marshal for the state. Um, a fire commissioner and the fire marshal mm -hmm. worked for me. We did two things that I thought really needed to be done. One is we aggressively started educating children on fire safety. It was being done by local fire departments when the fire department could do it. Atlanta, they could do it. You know, the Cab Gwinnett, the Rich County, Savannah, make, you know, people that had, I mean, the, the wealthier counties. The ones with I, the resources. Could do it. Mm -hmm. um, Others couldn't. We went out and we acquired through private donations three mobile fire safety houses. I remember that those. we would take around the state and teach children how to evacuate a house that was full of smoke. The other was in in the um, fraud. Excuse me, in the um, arson division. Again, the big cities they could afford to have an officer to investigate arson. You go to a small, smaller county, they didn't have anybody. So you'd, ha you'd have a policeman that had been investigating a drug case, now trying to investigate an arson case. And he would do the best he could. Oh, sure, sure. But they couldn't do it. You know, in Atlanta, Savannah, you could have a guy and all he did was investigate arsons, or several people, and all they would do. So w we got active in really building up the arson unit and placing them um, around the state and we actually built up a canine unit of three canines and there were arson accelerant detection canines that could go into a burnt out building and find the traces of accelerant that were used to burn the building down. That's amazing. And we had them stationed. We had one in North Georgia um, just outside of Ringgold, kind of covered the mountain area. Mm -hmm. 
they like start fires up there sometimes. <laughs> um, we had one in Macon, kind of covered, you know, sort of so the, that the, area Georgia. south and toward Columbus. And we had one uh, stationed uh, over toward Dublin, uh, and closer, uh, kind of getting a little closer to Savannah, between Dublin and Savannah. Okay. Um, and that one sort of took more of coastal Georgia, you know, so we stationed them out and we could serve the, the various areas of the state. And, and that's one thing we did. We try to take resources. And the one other, again, today it's different, but back then we started a program where we sent in every county at least once a month. Some bigger counties would go twice a month. But the smallest county, once a month, we would have a consumer services representative that would come to the local courthouse or city hall and be there in person to help you with an insurance problem. And we did that in all 159 counties. Um, I mean, obviously you could call the 1-800 number and call Atlanta, but I believe that government need to go to the people. Hmm. And so whether it was the fire marshal's office of taking government and resources to the lesser served areas or simply having a consumer services person from my consumer services division with insurance coming and talk. And I felt like it was important that government should be in these. I mean, we've got some very low population oh, sure. in poor counties in Georgia. Very. And government should go to see them. Now, of course, now it's a little different. You know, you do everything on the internet. You can Skype. I mean, times have changed, but back then, internet, I'm, t I'm talking the early 90s, <laughs> mid 90s. I'm talking 95, 96, 97. Internet was still a little the, new. The Netscape Navigator <laughs> days. For, yeah. For all, you know. any, anybody younger than me <laughs> is not going to remember Netscape Navigator <laughs> or Mosaic. Um, yeah. it, it was a different time, and it wasn't that long ago. It wasn't. So t tell me, you know, this, maybe we, we've touched on a little bit, but why do you think Georgia Democrats were able to hold on to power in this state? For, that, that Georgia was such a holdout for, for, for re voting for a Republican governor, uh, the General Assembly. Why were Democrats able to hold on here in the state? I think of my grandparents. My grandmother thought uh, my maternal grandmother um, to her, a Republican meant one of two things. Republicans were people that wore blue uniforms and came through the South in the 60s and burned everything, obviously meaning the, you know, the, the Yankee Army. Right. <laughs> General Grant's Yankee Army. The 1860s. <laughs> yes, I said the 60s, the 1860s, <laughs> to clarify that. But I mean, to my grandmother, those were the Yankees that burned and pillaged the South. Or... Republicans were the rich robber barons, you know, of, of 1910, early, yeah, you know, the 1880s, 90s to the 19, the, the, to the gilded 20s, age, yeah. you know, that, yeah, it was the Vanderbilts and the Rockefellers and, you know, my, both my parents grew up poor and I think at least with my family, that's what they thought Republicans were. You were either a New York millionaire or you were a Yankee soldier burning the farm. <laughs> and, you know, uh, times have changed. <laughs> right. Well, you know, speaking of change, what, what do you think it was that, that helped the Republican Party here in Georgia evolve from sort of the days where we're talking about Bob Bell and, and Johnny Isaacson and Paul Coverdell into a competitive and a majority party here in Georgia? I will tell you one thing that happened. It was Pat Robertson when he ran. He, and I am a Christian, and I mean, I, I pay extra so my son can go to a private school and learn about Jesus. Um, and I, we like Jesus and we talk about Jesus. Um, and I was never really part of the religious political right. Right. You know, that Pat Robertson mm -hmm. group. The Christian the coalition. Christian coalition. I was never really part of that group. Um, but one thing it did, it took, I love Johnny Isaacson, but the Johnny Isaacson or the Nelson Rockefellers were sort of the country club Republicans. 
And for the first time, or for a significant time, it was Republicans that had probably never seen a country club and never would. It was the, the Baptists coming out of the church became Republicans. And that's something that Pat really did when he ran for president. And at least in Georgia, and I think he made that change nationwide. I mean, I think that's where the Christian coalition came from. And you had Jerry Falwell at that time. Um, it, it was Christians started getting politically active. Well, when you do that and they get active on the Republican Party, you are getting everyday people active in the Republican Party, not the folks from the country club. Um, and I think that made a huge difference. And it went from that where at one time, I will tell you, the Christian coalition was extremely powerful in the Republican Party. I don't think it is that much anymore because the Christian coalition got everyday people in the party. But then as everyday people got in the party, it became the everyday people who might be Christian, might not be Christian, or if they're Christian, they may not just be part of the Christian coalition mm -hmm. group. Um, I mean, it just, be, and it just, it, it steps. And those steps started making it, at least in Georgia, more diverse, more everyday people. You know, the guy that used to, a guy that drove a truck would always be a Democrat. Today, most truck drivers I come across are Republicans. Farmers, every farmer was a Democrat. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I can find a Democratic farmer in Georgia today. I'd have to look hard to find one. <laughs> Maybe that's a cha <laughs> that's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Those blue collar workers, those farmers, they're Republicans today. They're not Democrats. Well, we're we're in this period, and it's less so here in Georgia, I think. But you know, things things could change uh, of hyper partisanship, mm -hmm. that, that especially in Washington, you know, con Congress. Uh, Functional is, is is optional sometimes, it seems. What is it about Georgia? What, what issues are there where Democrats, Republicans can find common ground or have found common ground or should? They should on every issue. Um, the parties are further apart now than they ever have been. Um, and it's also, we've gotten into the meanness used to, you respect it. I've never liked Barack Obama. I personally don't even think Barack Obama's a very good person, but I respected his office. He was the president, he was my president. And I don't have to like my president. If, if you got a job, you don't have to like your boss, but you respect him. If you're in the army, you probably don't like your drill sergeant, <laughs> but by God, you better respect them. And maybe some people might not like their parents all the time, but you respect them. And I respected Barack Obama for what he was. He was the president of the United States, and he was my president. I never would have said, not my president. I saw, I think it actually started with George Bush, um, when people started calling, uh, Second George. George, <laughs> George number <W>. two. <laughs> George W. <laughs> um, I don't know if you remember, people started call, saying he's a Nazi and he's a fascist. And they were equating George W. Bush to being a Nazi. Craziest thing that they would just, for Americans to say that about their pre president was just crazy. And it was shocking that it happened with Bush. Now, what's happened with Bush today that's happening with Trump? It's nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's insignificant. But it started there. And then you had everyone saying Barack Obama was this, and he was a communist, and he was all of that. Because people had just been bad-mouthing Bush, then people started bad-mouthing Obama. And now with our current president, the meanness has just gone to great heights. And what scares me is down the road, we will have a Democratic president someday. I personally think it'll be about six years from now. But when that day comes and we have a Democratic president, do I stand up and say he's not, he or she's not my president? Do we get to resist? I mean, what are we setting up for? You know? So, so, so <laughs> well, I think, I think what, you know, you, what I'm hearing is, is something I've, I've read quite a bit about recently, which is, you know, a, a crisis of legitimacy that, you know, we have a peaceful transfer of power 
and, and that peaceful transfer of power conveys some sort of legitimacy on, on the current president. What you're saying is that we're going down a trajectory where, depending on your partisan label, determines whether you're seen as a legitimate yeah. leader. Okay. And your, your government is legitimate and has to be legitimate. You may not like it, but it is your legitimate government. You need to honor right. and respect it. And I don't care if it's the state government. Your, it can be your local town mayor. Or it can be the president. Right. Well, you know, we, you know here, here in Georgia, from about Reconstruction to 2002, the Democrats were in power. Republicans have been in power since 2003, 2005. Mm -hmm. What do you think the biggest danger to the Republican majority here in the state is? It's the danger that would happen to any majority. And that's simply getting out of touch with what your people want. And I think the Democratic majority in Georgia got more in touch with what the National Party wanted and, and less in touch with what Georgians wanted, and they lost. I personally believe the Republican Party is staying in touch with what everyday Georgians want, but if they, if they don't continue that and they move away from that, then people are going to look for a change. And that's where the Democrats will grow. The other is um, influx of people and change in demographics. Uh, one thing that brought the Republicans to power were people moving in from out of state. A lot of business pe men mm -hmm. and women, uh, a lot of educated people, professional people moving into the state. They had a tendency to vote Republican. And that started changing a lot of stuff um, because they had been Republicans in their home state. Right. If people move into the state that might have been a Democrat in their old state, they're probably going to vote Democrat here. If they were a Republican in their old state, they're going to vote Republican here. So how the dynamics of people moving to the state will, will make changes. Uh, Atlanta is a massively growing city. There is nationally a huge disconnect between dense urban areas and the rest of the, right. of the country. Now, I, I remember Joe Frank Harris would prohibit people in his office from saying they're two Georgias. <laughs> that that kind of happened around the time of Governor yeah. Harris running. And he, I mean, he Professor would say, you Charles are prohibited. Floyd. I remember yeah. when Professor Floyd did that. And he said, no one, there are no, there's not two Georgias. And if you're on my payroll, you better not say it. Um, because it was Atlanta and the rest of the state. Well, there were two Georgias. There were two Georgias, and there are. You know, maybe there are three now. Probably Atlanta, coastal Georgia, and then maybe the rest of the state. You know, but you can break it up a few more times. But sure, sure. There are two Americas largely. There is the urban, densely populated America, and the the rest of the country. Atlanta is not quite that dense right. inner city population that a Chicago or even like a Miami may have. Mm -hmm. um, definitely a New Orleans has, a Houston has. Um, if Atlanta became, if Atlanta does become more of that dense urban atmosphere, mm -hmm. you know, the ITP, if maybe the whole IT inside the perimeter becomes very urban, I mean, that could change the demographics in the state. Mm -hmm. You know, we're sitting inside the perimeter um, right now, but I live outside the perimeter. In my neighborhood, I, I think we got one or two Democrats in our neighborhood. You know, we, <laughs> you know, we got to have someone to make fun of. You know, yeah, you know, have someone to tease, you know. <laughs> well, but, you know, I think that really begs the question because um, here, it, it, well, not here in Atlanta, this is a different, different district, but... Um, the 6th District, when, when Dr. Price mm -hmm. took over at HHS, special election, John Ossoff versus Karen Handel, uh, somebody you know well. That was my congressional, and I, and I was, I'm in that congressional seat. Okay, we are in that, I, I wasn't, I wasn't sure. My home is. Okay. We're, this office is not, okay. but my house, I voted okay. in that race. That's yeah. what I said, yeah. That's what happens when you're in this part of Metro Atlanta, you're not sure where exactly <laughs> you are. But, you know, that's a, a relatively safe Republican seat, mm -hmm. plus 12, plus 15, plus 16. 
John Ossoff was able to get with him four points. And, and John Ossoff, and no offense to John Ossoff, a relative newcomer, it, nobody really knew who, it, who he was, very articulate, very smart guy. Uh, how was he able to get so close in the 6th Congressional District? Newt Gingrich at Johnny Isaacson's old seat. It, it was a special election. And you can't, special elections, they're special. They're very unique. Um, it was not a traditional Republican primary mm -hmm. where you'd have all the Republicans get together and have a primary and pick who their candidate was going to be, you know, and then we would all have a unified Republican candidate. Democrats would get together and unify and pick out, and then you would have... That's not a special election, right? It was a, a jungle primary. Yeah, yeah, the jungle primary. It was a jungle primary, and that it it it. it I mean, yeah, Karen Handel was a Republican, Ossoff was Democrat, but neither one of them had ever actually been chosen by their party. Their party didn't get together and pick either one I of see. them. Is Karen got more votes among the Republicans, and Ossoff got more among the Democrats, but there was never that unified party choice. And I don't mean that bad to her, but I'm saying that would naturally be where you wouldn't have your unified parties right. voting. I think this election will be will, will be different. Well, how much how much of it do you think um, you know setting aside sort of those structural issues of the jungle primary, but how much of it is is a reaction to the president to, to President Trump that, that, that to sort of I don't think that's true at all. Um <laughs> You're the history expert. Uh, Johnny Isaacson uh -huh. got elected in a special primary. 1999. Um, and I believe... No, yes. Yeah. And I believe... And that was a solid... I mean, that was Newt Gingrich's mm -hmm. seat. It was a solid Republican. And I think the numbers there, I believe the Democrat did quite good for that ditch. I don't think... I mean, Johnny obviously got reelected, but Congressman Isaacson didn't get reelected as well as he should have. Mm -hmm. I mean, did not get elected as well as sure. he should have in that special election. I think it was it was much closer than it no, would have been expected. And that no one ever heard of Donald Trump except for being on TV. Um, you'll have to double check me, but I do believe the Democrat did very well. And I'm trying to remember who he was. I think he was in food service. He had a restaurant or he did some. I can't even remember what he did. But... Mm. <clears throat> we'll, we'll, yeah. you can, I'm, I'm sure you're going to check the numbers I, on I, me I'm, now. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I saw you writing down. You're going it, to go. It, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> I'm just disappointed in myself that I, I can't rattle it off, but it is late in the day. So <laughs> we'll, we'll chalk it up to that. But you know, demographics, how, how are the demographics here in, in, in Brookhaven, uh, in Johns Creek, in, in East Cobb, how have those changed since the 1980s, 1990s, when, the, as we were talking about earlier, the hotbed of republicanism in Georgia were these areas. How has it changed and why has it changed? And what's the consequences politically? I think it's people moving into the state. I mean, I saw massive numbers about how many people are moving into Georgia every month. And it's Atlanta and Georgia are largely going to be a reflection of the people coming in and where they came from. Mm -hmm. I mean, if if we have 100,000 people next month move to Atlanta, if most of them were Democrats in their home state, most of them are going to be Democrats here. If most of them were Republicans in their home state, they're going to be Republicans here. Right. And so that's, and that's something that just happens. And unless you're going to build a wall at the state border and, <laughs> and, and check people, um, I don't know how you control that. It's right. just simply who, if more Democrats move here, we'll become Democratic. If more Republicans move here, we'll become, we'll stay Republican. So you, there's an election coming up, I think it is 55 days? Yeah, about, give a, or take. about six weeks, give, give, give or take. Give or take. Yeah. Do you think the national mood and momentum seems to suggest Democrats will, will make gains you know, throughout the country? What do you think it's going to be like here in Georgia? My experience is that whole thing of 
right after a president gets elected that his party doesn't do well in Congress is limited to Congress. Uh, that is a congressional thing. I don't, I have never seen that in statewide politics in Georgia. And I don't think it really happens that much in other states. I think it's a merely a congressional Washington thing, but in the state, people are gonna vote for who they would vote for, regardless of that, you know, history of sure. the sure. president not having as good of a day in his two years after his election. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that of course that goes with both parties. I mean, you know, Bill Clinton had that problem. Barack Obama had that problem. Every presidents have had that problem, but I've never seen that affected state races in Georgia. I would say the, the, the one race that you know, people are, that, that sort of has, has bucked the trend is the governor's race. With, with, you know, we, we've mentioned Brian Kemp uh, from, from Athens. Um, his opponent, Stacey Abrams, is running a, a, a very different style of campaign than previous Democrats. Jason Carter four mm -hmm. years ago, Governor Barnes in 2010, and uh, Mark Taylor, 2006, mm -hmm. sort of centrist, center-left, pro-business, pro-gun in the case of, of, of Jason Carter, uh, Democrats. Stacey Abrams is trying a different model. Yes. You're, you're a, a, a Republican confirmed. What do you think of, of, of the strategy? I think she's. I think she's making a mistake. Um, if, if, and hopefully she doesn't. You don't show her this until after <laughs> she loses. <laughs> but I mean, if I were advising the Democrat, I would say the left wing Democrats are going to vote for you. And I would tell a Republican the right wing Republicans are going to vote for you. So you need to work on that middle. You know, it's still saying that, you know, most places are one-third liberal, one-third conservative, and one-third in the middle. And give or take, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, by running to, run to your base in a primary, but when you run to your base in a general election, I mean, I have a lot of good Democratic friends. Uh, a lot of them are lawyers, and we've been friends for a long time. Um, they're like... I'm either going to vote Republican or just not vote. I've had a lot of my, you know, and mainly more lawyers and people like that, but I mean, they'll, they'll say, I, I can't vote for her because they're, they're older, they're old-fashioned Southern conservatives, and, I mean, Southern Democrats, but, you know, it's, now they might not admit it publicly. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and in my races, I actually had a lot of Democrats voted for me in my general election. Well, if you go back to the '90s, if you're just looking at pure numbers, you had to have gotten some some Democrats to vote for you. There were not that I, yeah. many Republicans. I had a lot of people tell me that they voted for me. I mean, I can't tell you. I mean, folks would say, "John, you're the only Democrat. I mean, you're the only Republican I ever voted for." I mean, I had a lot of people tell me that over the years. Um, and, and, and actually my numbers, because my numbers would often exceed the person who won the governor's race. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was clearly getting crossover votes from the other party. Yeah, Republicans control all statewide offices. Um, not, not quite a supermajority in the state Senate anymore, but hefty majorities mm -hmm. in, the, in the General Assembly. What do you... What do you think the future of the two-party system is? It's, it's going to change. It'll yeah. come back. Yeah, it's, going, it's, it's a cycle. I mean, I, I think the next change will be more of a true two-party system. We went from a one-party Democrat to a one-party Republican. The fact is, we really didn't change that much. It was just that group of Democrats in the middle switched to become Republicans, and but it's going to change eventually. It's going to change eventually, one way or the other, and, and it'll be a mix. Um, and I hope the two parties can get together and work together. Um, having the polarization, that'll be the, that'll be the study for PhDs down the road, is the polarization of the two parties. And it, it, 
and you know a lot more about political science than I do, but I think polarization of parties works in a parliamentary system like Europe. You got five parties, you can have a lot of polarization. Uh, but when you, I, for a two party country that essentially only has two functional parties in mm -hmm. America, mm -hmm. to have polarization, I don't know how you govern. And I think we're seeing Washington, it's where it's, you know, if, if the Democrats were to take the House, I mean, I don't know if anything will ever get done in Washington. I mean, it just made Washington, which actually might be the best thing for America, if Washington just shuts down. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you know we, we covered a lot of ground. Uh, so what's next for you, personally? Uh, you know, just not do, politics. Doing, <laughs> <laughs> That's the question I always get. Don't you want to get back I, I into it? Don't I got you that ever... vibe. From... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I kind of joke. Um, I say, well... I don't have to go back into politics. I can actually, I'm employable. I can actually find a real job. <laughs> and, I, and I say it kind of tongue in cheek, but I mean, there's some people that just have to be in it and be in the politics and in the limelight. Be honest, I make more money. I have more time with my family. I dress a lot more comfortable. <laughs> um, I'm happy. I have, my wife would probably divorce me if I told her I was going to run for political office again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'll, I'll let I'll let folks in on a secret. I remember my wife, then girlfriend, making me promise that there would be no politics. <laughs> so that that's why I'm here in the uh, in, in academia. <laughs> well, anyway, since you're speaking speaking of your family, you probably have a a young child to go pick up from school. Yes, I do. But uh, on behalf of the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia, thank you very much, Mr. John Oxendine. Uh, really, uh, as you can tell, I think we enjoyed ourselves having this conversation. It's been a lot of fun. Re really do appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you.